Hi everyone. Good morning. I just had a call from uh, from our friends at the uh, British Embassy in Copenhagen, who are having a little bit of technical uh, difficulties, but uh, we'll be sorting them out. So, so just bear with with us for a couple of minutes more before we get started. Uh, one second. Det er godt. Vi går til dig. Excellent. I think uh, I think we're ready to go. Sorry for the uh, for the slow de start and uh, the little delay, but uh, but we are, we're ready to uh, get going now. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome, and thank you very much for joining us uh, here today. My name is Rasmus Traber, and I cover the energy sector here at the Danish Embassy in London. For, uh, for the past eight years, uh, I've been organizing this conference here, uh, and uh, the, the purpose is, of course, that we bring together the, uh, the Danish and the UK supply chain um, to talk about both the opportunities and the challenges that are in the UK offshore wind market. Uh, it would be it would be a real shame if uh, if we were to break this streak uh, since we have organized this event uh, eight years in a row. But uh, not only because obviously it's a shame to break a streak, but uh, but also um, but also because there is a unique situation. 
So never has there been uh, such a significant market opportunity uh, and never has there been so much political goodwill, but also uh, never so many. I think one of the microphones is probably not muted. Great. But also, uh, besides the market opportunities, there's never been so many interesting challenges for the industry to address. So over the next one and a half hours, we uh, we will um, we'll hear both uh, uh, speakers address their challenges and opportunities. Before we run straight into today's uh, program, I would also like just to say thank you uh, on behalf of the DK UK Association and the Danish Embassy. But, uh, but also a big thank you. I think, could everyone just check that their microphones are muted? Great. Uh, yeah, but, uh, but as I said, also a big thank you to Austin, to Associate British Ports, and to Fowling for supporting today's conference. In terms of organizing this event, we're also really pleased to have the support from the British Embassy in Copenhagen, the British Chamber of Commerce, as well as Energy Cluster Denmark. Now, as, uh, as most of you would agree, Denmark and the UK already enjoy an excellent trading relationship, uh, and we also share so many of the same values, not at least uh, in connection with today's topic, our concern for climate change as well as our drive to develop green solutions uh, and green energy for the future. In the coming days and weeks, uh, all eyes will be on Britain as it enters a new relationship with Europe. And on that note, I am uh, delighted to have Emma Hopkins with us, the newly appointed British Ambassador to Denmark, uh, here to open today's conference. Emma, over to you. Uh, good morning. I hope you can still hear me. We have technical difficulties this morning. Uh, but do let me know in the chat if there are problems uh, with the sound. But if you can hear me, then it's an absolute pleasure to be here this morning uh, to speak to such a large and diverse audience with interest in the offshore wind sector. Um, so thank you for tuning in today and for the Danish UK Association and the Danish Embassy for inviting me to participate and my team here at the Embassy. Of course, the climate crisis has been with us all for a long time and our response to it has been compounded this year, especially by the global coronavirus pandemic and the impact that that will have on the global economy for many years to come. So today, uh, like many other countries, the UK is facing some critical choices on how we help our economy to recover from COVID-19 and not undermine progress that has been made on the climate agenda. So recently, the UK government has made some important political and policy announcements that have underlined the UK's strong commitment to building back in a green way that I would like to spend just a few minutes highlighting. A few weeks ago, firstly, Prime Minister Boris Johnson set out his 10-point plan, which I hope you will have seen, for a UK green industrial revolution, which will allow the UK to forge ahead with eradicating its contribution to climate change by 2050. It covers clean energy, transport, nature, and innovative technologies. And the blueprint will also create and support up to 250,000 jobs. It's also significant because it steps up the UK's leadership on climate change ahead of us co-hosting a Climate Ambition Summit uh, on the December the 12th and also COP26 in Glasgow towards the end of next year. And listed at number one of the 10-point plan is the commitment to produce enough offshore wind to power every home quadrupling how much we produce to 40 gigawatts by 2030. And that's really front and center to the overall strategy. I think later this morning, you'll hear from my colleague uh, from the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, Dr. Sarah Redwood, and she'll set out some more detail on, on how the UK intends to realize uh, that aspirations on that target. But the 10-point plan also follows from uh, another statement from Prime Minister Johnson pledging in October to deliver a greener, fairer and more resilient economy. 
And offshore wind will be an integral part of that, making sure we maximise the benefits of our road to net zero. I want to say a few words about the Climate Ambition Summit. Uh, which will take place in two days' time, virtually, alongside our partners from both the UN, France, Italy and Chile. And the purpose of that summit is really, I suppose, to press the international community to come forward with ambitious and new national announcements, showcasing the steps that they've taken to combat climate change in 2020. And it's having a clear focus on commitments to adaptation, to nationally determined contribution, and crucially, green finance. It's also intended to be a waypoint to COP26 uh, next year, and intended to prompt countries to consider how their economic recoveries can be green. The UK has always been clear that five years on from the Paris Agreement, we need to see drastic steps if we're going to meet the climate uh, challenge that poses to us all while still meeting our global energy needs. And for the UK, this very much includes levelling up both private and public investments across the economy, with significant weight given to further developing our offshore wind, wind footprint, something that both the UK and Denmark have a shared interest in developing. We've committed uh, 5.8 billion in international climate finance between 2016 and 2021. And just last Friday, the Prime Minister confirmed that the UK's national determined contribution will be a 68% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by the end of the decade, compared to 1990 levels. But we're also delighted that Denmark are also leading the way, and their announcement last week that they would end oil and gas extraction in the North Sea will also be a significant contribution, encouraging others to be ambitious also. So the path to net zero is one that involves active participation from national states around the globe, and the UK are trying to corral others in that endeavour. And we really hope that COP26 will be a very important moment uh, to crystallise uh, those commitments. In our own region, constructing and expanding a grid system that will allow for businesses to scale up. The offshore wind industry is one example of that kind of cross-border collaboration. And at the moment, you will all know from the news that we're in the final stages of our negotiations with the EU about what the shape of our future relationship will be. And one outcome from the UK's departure from the EU may be the loss of its seat on the North Sea Energy Corporation, which would be regrettable as cooperation between the UK and those countries is clearly in everyone's interest. However, whatever the eventual outcome, it's clear that the UK wants to have a strong voice on the North Sea market as well as the future developments of infrastructure required for efficient use of energy generated by all nations offshore wind sectors. And it's crucial uh, from a UK perspective that we're included in that work. So we're keen to find ways to re-establish active cooperation with other countries and the Commission. And there are constructive discussions underway on this as part of the EU-UK negotiations on our future partnership. If we're not part of a North Sea alliance, we are looking to initiate bilateral discussions with Denmark. And our two countries have shared objectives in offshore wind, with the future connection of giant projects on both sides of the water being a really live issue at the moment. And this will be a key priority both for myself and all my team here at the embassy across 2021. But a precondition to growth and prosperity is for businesses to operate in a free and open market. And that's why trade between the UK and Denmark and the EU is of huge importance to both sides. Regardless of the outcome of our current negotiations, we know that we'll continue to be very close allies. And we very much value the contribution that Danish businesses are making here in the UK in this sector. We also need energy and overseas investments stay, play an crucial role in providing it both directly, but also in mushrooming up the nation supply chains that are still being shaped across the UK today. And to support our foreign investors, last month we uh, launched a new office for investment, which sits both under our Department for Trade and our Department for Business, Energy and, and Industrial Strategy. And the purpose of that office is really to align with key government priorities and offer support to those who want to continue to invest in the UK. Uh, in different sectors, and offshore wind is a key one. 
So uh, just to end then, I hope that I've conveyed, I think, what is a strong political, commercial and environmental objective that the UK government has set out to grow the offshore wind industry in the UK. And although we are currently grappling with uh, some uncertainty in different quarters over the future, I don't think there is any uncertainty about the level of ambition and the forward momentum that exists in the UK today on offshore wind. So I wish you a productive and interesting morning, and I look forward to having the opportunity in non-COVID times to meeting many of you and understanding how we can work together in pursuit of some of these shared objectives. Thank you very much. Ambassador, thank you so much for for your for your welcome and for your uh, for your introduction. It's really encouraging to hear uh, all the commitments there are to uh, not just only combating climate change, but also to ensuring that this excellent trading uh, relationship we have between uh, Denmark and the UK continue. So thank you very much for for your time today. Uh, as uh, alluded to, we are now handing over to our next speaker, uh, Sarah Redwood. Um, who is the Director for Renewable Energy Deployment at the Department for Business Energy and Industrial Strategy. And Sarah will, as the ambassador just mentioned, take a closer look uh, at what is actually uh, coming up in terms of markets uh, for offshore wind in the years to come. Sarah, thank you for joining us. Brilliant. Thank you all. And it's a real honor to be here. Um, I will repeat a few of the things that Emma said about the Prime Minister's announcements, mainly because they're so exciting and I really think they do frame um, the market and uh, the future that we're setting out here. Um, so to reiterate, the UK government is really committed to achieving decarbonisation across the economy, which will be necessary to meet our net zero obligations. And offshore wind really has a pivotal role to play in this which is why it was number one of the Prime Minister's 10-point plan for economic growth that was announced at the start of this month. And um, there was offshore wind turbines uh, on the front page and featured throughout. By 2030, we plan to have a world-leading offshore wind industry with the ability to power every home in the UK. And to do that, we've increased our target for offshore wind power from 30 gigawatts to 40 gigawatts by 2030. And that target includes a one gigawatt target for floating offshore winds, which we hope will pave the way for commercial scale deployment in the 2030s and beyond. We saw yesterday in the report from the Committee on Climate Change on Carbon Budget 6, the important role of offshore winds. And they set out um, some of the ranges that would be needed for offshore wind with sort of citing between 65 and 125 gigawatts by 2050, so it's an enormous expansion of what we see today. And what does that mean in practice? Well, really, it's sort of three gigawatts of new wind capacity per year and repowering of existing sites when they come to the end of their lifetime. So a real potential um, for, for a really big, exciting market here. So what does this actually mean for the pipeline? How do we break it down? What's it, what, what does it really mean for what we have? We've got approximately 10 gigawatts of offshore wind capacity already in place, with another 9.5 gigawatts in various stages of construction. And at the end of 2019, we had over 40 operational offshore wind farms with around 2,200 turbines. The capacity of the individual offshore wind turbines is getting ever larger. I'm constantly hearing about bigger and more exciting um, projects. But to reach 40 gigawatts, we think it would require between 1,500 and 2,000 turbines to be installed between now and 2030, which is huge. Our overall pipeline continues to grow, and there are a number of significant projects in the planning process already. And the Crown Estates Round 4 and Crown Estates States Scotland Scotland leasing progress could produce around 18 gigawatts of new projects, but we'll know the numbers um, in for more, with more certainty next year after the bidding. And Crown Estate have just now started undertaking market engagement to really test out the appetite for floating wind seabed rights. We know that there's a lot of interest in building floating wind in the UK, as you would expect, um, as we, given we have such a big offshore wind market and have rich deep water resource. And we're really confident that developers will respond positively to this ambition and expect to see more projects be ready later in the decade. 
Boating really opens up new areas of the sea and deeper waters further from the shore. And it's likely that we'll need more offshore wind to meet net zero and that we'll really need floating as the fixed bottom sites are progressively used up. And our aim is really to stimulate development now so that we can see the costs come down and build up uh, the supply chain for meeting these ambitions. So how do we make this all happen? Well, our main mechanism for support is a contract for different mechanisms. And to help deliver the ambitious 40 gigawatt target, we will seek to deliver up to double the electricity generation capacity in the next alloc allocation round compared to the one that we saw um, previously. And the next round is due to open in late 2021. These auctions have been very successful in incentivizing investment while realizing the best value for money for the electricity consumer. And we've seen the clearing prices come down two thirds since the first auction in 2015 for offshore winds. So from a clearing price of around 115 megawatt hours in 2015 to around 40 megawatt hours in 2019. We recently um, published a response to our consultation on the design of the next round of the contract for difference um, auction, including that offshore winds will have its own pot and that floating offshore will be treated as a separate technology to fix bottom with its own administrative strike price. And we've also made some changes to make sure that the auction functions more smoothly and um, is easier for um, participants. And we'll be publishing more details on the auction closer to the time. We really hope that by setting these ambitious targets and setting out the um, ambition for the capacity at the next round of the auction, that we can help provide investor certainty over the scale of the market that is needed to develop this ambitious type pipeline. We think that adding another 30 gigawatts above what's already operational could cost about 50 billion of extra private sector investment. So there's huge opportunities here. And recent experience suggests that offshore wind farms, which generate low electricity for the long, low cost electricity for the long term, are an attractive investment prospect. And we've really seen significant interest in new seabed leasing around the UK. But we know that there's challenges to delivering the 40 gigawatt target. And that's why we're working really collaboratively across government and with industry and with many of those that are represented here today to tackle the barriers and ensure that we have a healthy pipeline. So I just wanted to give a couple of examples that we're working on. One of these is on radar, where we're working with our Ministry of Defence and with the Offshore Wind Industry Council to really look at practical near-term and long-term enduring solutions for um, preventing defence radar interference. And we've launched an innovation competition to look at um, longer term next generation surveillance and mitigation solutions. We're also looking at the potential environmental barriers to deployment. And we're working with our Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs with a joint program to look at enabling actions. And we're also working with Crown Estates and the Crown Estate Scotland to really build the evidence base to understand um, what's happening and what are some of the concrete actions that we could take place. And that's looking at things like marine noise, use of big data, and how to achieve net gain from offshore wind deployment rather than simply um, preventing environmental problems. And we're also working with Ofgem, our regulator, to look at the transmission costs and to ensure that future connections for offshore wind are delivered in the most appropriate way to finding the balance between environment, social and economic costs. And that review will um, aim to publish next year. The final area that I want to talk about is UK content and really how we can maximise the economic benefits from the huge um, market that we're creating um, to help support the UK economy. And the same should apply to any such development, whether it's civil engineering, the delivery of renewable energy, or other forms of low carbon generation like nuclear. We're working with industry, including many Danish companies represented here today through the offshore wind sector deal to support the target of having 60% UK content by 2030. And we're developing a number of measures to help support that. So we're 160 million into modern integrated port side offshore wind infrastructure here in the UK, which will also help provide high quality employment in the coastal regions. 
We understand that this is one of the biggest barriers to having manufacturing facilities in the UK and there's companies that are investing here. And we've heard from industry about how important it is that we do this quickly, so we're doing it really fast. And we've already launched a competitive process to select the first integrated manufacturing port hub. We hope that these facilities will increase the competitiveness of the UK offshore wind sector and supply chain, enabling the UK to win the contracts that will be needed to deliver our industrial ambition and to also um, compete keenly for other opportunities. We're also consulting on proposals to strengthen um, the contract for difference mechanism and look at our supply chain plan policy. So through this, we'll really make it clear the importance of having UK content and there'll be a consequence for non-delivery to ensure that developers really do deliver on their commitments so that the UK can reap the benefits of um, the market that we're creating and the significant investments that we're making into our industry. So to conclude and wrap up, just my four main points are that we're creating a really ambitious market for offshore wind in the UK here with targets for 40 gigawatts by 2030. We were aiming to deliver double the ambition of renewables at the next allocation round of the contract for different auction, auction, which will run in late 2021. And we're really taking serious actions to tackle barriers to deployment and make it as easy as possible to do business here in the UK and to build those wind farms. So working collaboratively across government and with industry and stakeholders. And finally, we really want to see the economic benefits of this ever-expanding market and we want to increase the competitiveness of the UK offshore wind sector and the supply chain so that the UK is seen as a great place to come and do business and help contribute and access that, that huge market and opportunities. Thank you very much. I'll finish there. So I think it's really uh, exciting to hear about all the possibilities there are for, for collaboration. I wonder, do you have a moment for, for two questions from the chat? I'll stay away then. So I'll put them together. Uh, and uh, the first question is uh, is probably related to the uh, Committee on Climate Change uh, doing the modeling for reaching net zero and whether there is any pro uh, projections on how many um, uh, turbines are actually needed to reach uh, net zero in the scenario. And the other question, uh, uh, is uh, quite interesting as we are talking a lot about sort of uh, increasing deployment. Then uh, the other question goes along uh, whether there are any plans for decommissioning as well. So two thank questions. You very, you. Yeah, thank you very much and both really good questions. I have to admit we've not done the detailed modelling yet of how many wind turbines would be needed to meet the uh, net zero targets of um, as set out by um, the Committee on Climate Change and some of our ones. Um, a lot of this is really dependent on the exact role of offshore wind within that. And we take a fairly sort of technology, we don't have specific um, technology targets out to 2050 on that. Um, and it will also obviously depend on the, um, how, on sort of innovation, research and development and how the, um, the capacity of the wind farms change and the turbines improve. And we're seeing efficiencies um, every day on those. So I think that's very exciting. Um, the other question about decommissioning is a really good one. And it's something we're really, really, um, that's really, really important. And that is one of the conditions of when we're doing the planning consent to ensure that sufficient um, focus has been put on decommissioning. Um, I think there's a case of how we actually making sure we've got plans for decommissioning um, and also plans for sort of before that trying to repower some of the sites when they come to the end of their natural life as well. Do you want me to try and pick up some of the other ones or? Um... I can see uh, we probably have time for one more. I can see that there is actually one that probably alludes to uh, to your background. Uh, the question uh, looking at the horizon uh, and EU funding for uh, collaboration in terms of research and innovation. But uh, but it's up to you what you would, uh, if you would like to take a pick. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, look, that one's not really, I mean, on that one, it's obviously very dependent on what is happening with the future relationship of the EU. Um, I used to work on this policy, so I'm deeply passionate about it. 
um, and the role of innovation and R&D in the offshore wind sector is something that I'm very, very keen to see. Um, I'll pick up on the other one from Pete around the consultation on the supply chain policy. We've already got a consultation out already about the process, and we expect to consult um, very shortly on what questionnaire we'll actually be doing, so what sort of questions we'll be asking the developers to do. And in looking at local content, we're really thinking both about the CAPEX and the OPEX and how we can support the industry's target of having 60% UK content by 2030. Great. I think uh, we will have to move on to the to the next speaker. But thank you so much for joining us, Sarah, and thank you for for taking the questions as well. Thank you. It's a pleasure thank to you. be here. So, uh, so the next um, the next session is put in uh, because it's an interesting discussion, but also it will allow me to run out and get a cup of coffee because I am handing over the moderator role to uh, to Gareth from Gowling in a second. Uh, if I should just introduce uh, this uh, session, I would say that it's fair to say that the offshore wind sector in the UK is a success story, as we just heard from uh, from Sarah. The UK has the largest installed capacity of offshore wind in the world, and cost of offshore wind has fallen much more over the past 10 years than anyone could probably have imagined. Uh, there's also a flourishing um, uh, ability to create larger uh, projects, and also to uh, to deliver these offshore wind projects to more uh, dependable timescales as well. Uh, it's also creating well-paid jobs around the country and uh, creating skilled jobs. But um, but if uh, but if we look to the future, and that's where uh, the panel here will will uh, come with its uh, view. Then, uh, what is actually needed in terms of uh, of the offshore wind industry uh, and the supply chain in our ports uh, when we are uh, going towards uh, 40 by 30? So, I'm really pleased to hand over to Gareth now, Gareth now uh, from the European International Law Firm Gowling, who will uh, introduce the session and also the panelists. Gareth, over to you. Thank you very much, Rasmus, and uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for having us along today. Um, so, Rasmus has done a very good job of introducing the objectives of this session. I'll say a little bit about um, the, the people and the structure. Um, first of all, um, I am a partner at the law firm Galling WLG. I co-lead our global energy sector group. Um, we do an awful lot of work across that sector, including in offshore wind. And I hope my Danish friends will forgive me for quoting a Norwegian example, um, which is that we recently advised Statcraft on their PPA on the Sea Green transaction, which is a very substantial um, offshore wind farm um, in the UK. Um, we are going to talk today um, and develop a little bit more thinking around um, the implementation of how we reach this objective of of many more gigawatts um, in our seas. Um, the, the industry has done fantastically well already, and even if we didn't do any more, there are fantastic supply chain opportunities around O&M, but there's a, a huge next step to be done as well, and that will require a lot of work and a lot of opportunity for the supply chain, which is great news. Um, the structure of the session is that we are going to have three speakers um, who I'm going to introduce now, and they will then present uh, for a short period in a in a in a running order. Um, and then we're going to have and would really uh, like to have a good and interactive Q and A session following um, these presentations. So please do as you've been doing so far, add your questions to the chat function um, and I will do my very best to pick them up um, specifically and in themes and to put them to our high caliber panelists today. So um, the running order is, first of all, we're going to hear from uh, Sanjana Acha, who is uh, from Equinor. The title of her uh, presentation is Building a North Sea Broad Energy Hub. And then we're going to be followed by Mary Thorogood, who is from MHI Vestas, and she is going to talk about growing the UK supply chain. And then we're going to conclude with Andy Ray, 
from Associated British Ports, whose presentation is titled Serving the UK's Offshore Wind Industry. So, um, without further ado, I propose Sanjana to mute and to um, let you kick off. Brilliant. Uh, thank you. I was uh, wondering, uh, yeah, perfect. So uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, for attending. And thanks a lot, uh, Gareth and Rasmus, for introducing and giving me the opportunity to present here. I suppose uh, what I'll be really taking you through is you know, our idea of what a North Sea Energy Hub is and ultimately how do we get to that 40 by 30. Uh, I don't seem to have control over the presentation, so if you could go to the next slide, please, that would be great. Um, so just to give you a bit of an introduction of who we are, really, um, we in Econar really are a broad energy company with our origins in Norway. We have over 21,000 employees working in oil, gas, wind and solar over, uh, in over 30 countries. And we've been a part of the North Sea for over five decades now, and we're the biggest uh, oil and gas operator in the North Sea. Developing our, uh, you know, our resources in oil and gas allowed us to get a lot of strong experience in um, offshore technology. And decades of you know, operating here has sort of given us the insights and knowledge that we're transferring to offshore wind right now. And we have a very clear strategy for, for this. Our strategic direction is to develop a broad energy company and become a leader in offshore wind. And to be that leader, we are implementing something called a value-driven strategy, and we're establishing uh, regional clusters to get that. These clusters, really, North Sea is, um, is, is one of those, uh, with UK as a heavyweight, the Baltic Sea, and the East Coast of US. I suppose beyond these uh, clusters, we're also pursuing opportunities across Europe and regions such as Asia and the Americas. And we have a very clear target. We want to in uh, increase the renewable capacity by 30 times what it is today and get between 12 to 16 gigawatts of net capacity by 2035. And we think the North Sea will be a very key contributor to getting to these ambitions. And so then, first and foremost, the way we want to do this is to maximize our value of our offshore wind assets. So we currently have a portfolio of something like 750 megawatts of operational assets uh, in the UK with Dungeon and Sharon Control in the east coast of England, Taiwan, Scotland, which is off the coast of Peterhead in Scotland. We're also building the world's largest um, offshore wind farm in the UK, Dogger Bank, with SSE, which is 3.6 gigawatts, and due to start up in 2023. And we're proposing to double the capacity of Dudgeon and Sheringham show. Finally, outside of the UK, we have the world's first floating uh, wind power to power offshore oil and gas, which is due to start up in 2022. Really, we are trying to drive continuous improvements, uh, standardize, and really benefit from these scale synergies in both operations and projects. We're also, trying, we're also expanding our portfolio in the North Sea countries, in the UK and beyond, and help the North Sea countries to achieve their climate ambitions. And we really want to use the North Sea to demonstrate the global potential for, uh, for floating by scaling the technology in the region. And I suppose, ultimately, what we're trying to do here is, uh, you know, we, our vision is to shape up a North Sea broad energy hub where offshore wind is connected to other energy and low-carbon solution. So to get to this 40 by 30, technology will play a very key role. And we began demonstrating this at Dogger Bank, our flagship for innovation and digitalization. We're using uh, GE's 13 megawatt Halliate X uh, turbine, which is being installed by the largest turbine installation vessel for science, the Walter. We're also using a HPDC system, which is the first for UK offshore wind. And we are also using digitalization, data science, uh, robotics, to essentially optimize and make it as efficient as possible. Well, one thing to also note here is, um, you know, offshore wind alone will not help us get to net zero in the UK. The North Sea has a lot of uh, resources and very extensive infrastructure here, and it's a very ideal backdrop for a broad energy hub. And we believe uh, offshore wind, together with storage and hydrogen, is key to create that broad energy hub in the North Sea. Um, and I suppose uh, we're trying to do that with our pilot Batwind, which is the world's first battery for offshore wind connected to Highwind Scotland. 
And just a couple of days ago on the 7th, we joined Europe's uh, biggest green hydrogen project in Netherlands, North H2, which aims to produce hydrogen using technology from offshore wind off the coast of Netherlands. And we're also pioneering low carbon technology, such as a zero carbon Humber and a Northern Lights in uh, Norway. So finally, and a finally important component here is to get to net zero, to get to 40 by 30 is floating wind. Uh, Sarah mentioned a bit about this as well, and I want to dive deeper here. You know, the 80% of uh, world's wind resources need floating solutions to be commercialized as they're in water to very great depth. And we're already begun using the North Sea to pioneer this technology. First with Highland Demo back in 2009, to Highland Scotland, then to Tampin in Norway. And we really believe that commercializing floating and uh, getting it to utility scale is something that is needed for commercial deployment. And we expect this to be happening sometime in the end of this decade and early 2030s. Um, and scale effects, competitive uh, supply chain and both continuous and disruptive innovation is really key to achieving this uh, parity in terms of cost between floating and fixed. And really, really believe, uh, you know, a good collaboration with the supply chain, good collaboration with the government will help us achieve this by, by the end of 2020s, early 2030s. So with that, I suppose I'll conclude this by saying I'll leave you one thought in your mind which is the North Sea is a very good area to have a large potential for offshore wind and to create a broad energy hub. And with a lot of strong collaboration and using innovation with both the government and supply chain, we'll have the enablers to get that 40 by 2030 and then finally net, uh, net zero. So thank you. Thank you very much, Sanjay. Um, so, uh, just, just before we move on to Mary, just a, just a reminder that we have the chat function, um, so please do add in your questions, and uh, we'll pick those questions up when we get to the end of the three, third session. Um, so now I'd like to hand over to Mary Thorogood of MHI Vestas. Great, thanks, Gareth, and I hope everyone can hear me hear me well. Um, hopefully, I'll talk a little bit and try and bring to life actually some of what the policy and the frameworks we've been talking about have actually achieved so far in the UK and a little bit about the future as well. Um, I start with this slide just to show we talk a lot about assets, components, factories, but actually we like to remember the people, people that sit behind those and the people that we employ. So just a selection here from those, those employed, the 700 or so employed on our Isle of Wight Blade, Blade facility. Um, next slide, please. Um, UK, 50% of MHI Vestas' market, and we employ nearly 1,000 people directly here and, of course, have a growing supply chain right across the UK. So a key centre, key competence centre for our V16 and V174, which, of course, we're now taking, taking globally. And 2021 is going to be a really exciting, exciting year for us in the UK. As we speak, um, the turbines from Kinkadeen are making their way making their way over to us from the Netherlands. That's a 50 megawatt floating project in Scotland. We'll be, we're currently pre-assembling for Moray South East and Triton Knoll in Abel Seaton and in Scotland respectively. And of course, we'll start preparations for SSE's Sea Green project, which will be just over a gigawatt off the coast of Scotland. So really exciting year for us in 2021. And of course, you will have all read about um, our new upcoming relationship with Vestas as well, which we're looking forward to looking forward to realising next year. Next slide, please. Um, we've been in the UK on the Isle of Wight and servicing our projects since our inception as a joint venture in 2014. And with with that with that presence has come long term relationship with our um, with our supply chain, particularly on the Isle of Wight and the South Coast to support our blade facility, which has grown from one mould to two mould two moulds over that time. And just a selection of the businesses that we've worked with locally, um, existing businesses on the South Coast, obviously great specialisms in composite manufacturing, particularly there already, where we've worked with businesses to grow the FTEs they employ, introduce new technologies to support our business, which of course that business can again take to new, to new customers. And of course, work with new suppliers in our supply chain as well. You know, safeguarding, designing new vessels, but also safeguarding 
existing businesses as they diverse as they diversify into into this new industry. So super exciting on the south coast, but also in our service locations around the country as well. Next slide, please. Um, again, I touched on people at the top. Um, the, the expansion of the industry is super exciting, but we're going to need a lot of people to support that expansion as well. We're investing on that already on the Isle of Wight, working closely with the local enterprise partnership and also the local colleges there to invest in a skills program that trains. We train all of our workforce on the Isle of Wight at this facility. We support them to train in MVQ levels, that's technical, technical education. We're employed, we do lots of things there to make sure we establish those core skills in that facility, which we then take into our own facility and, of course, add a MHI Vestas flavour to those basic skills. So I think it's really important for the UK to remember, yes, of course, we need to invest in CAPEX, OPEX, all those things, but we also need to invest in our, in our people as well. Next slide, please. So I thought I'd show a little bit of what we're actually actually doing today, which is super exciting. Offshore wind has such long time scales we often to get to get we often don't often get to that exciting bit where we're actually assembling, manufacturing and operating turbines. So this is our assembly assembly for Triton Knoll at Abel Seaton, which is currently underway. And you can see there actually we have the towers, the blades beginning to be assembled for the start of installation um early early next year. So really exciting time for us and it's always great for me personally to actually see see the planning see the planning become become real but what's also interesting on on this is to pick up some of what sarah was saying about the port investment that government's looking at doing if you go to the next slide as well it's just another slide of the similar another angle of um abel seaton i think colleagues who are familiar with esbjerg in denmark and also cookshaven can actually see this is a really small small space to be assembling assembling a project from and turbines turbines are getting bigger so from our perspective the government's investment in ports is really welcome because we need to be able to compete with Esbjerg, Cuxhaven, Zissingen, all those big European ports to really provide the space not only for fixed foundation but also floating foundations who are even more space hungry than fixed is so I think these these two slides are a really good illustration of how exciting it is for the UK, but also how much we have to do to really upgrade our port infrastructure to service these wind farms, but also to attract the businesses to come and, come and, invest, come and invest in the UK. So next slide. Perhaps to move a little bit onto the future, I think the title, the title is Partnerships for this session. So I think it's really important to highlight both the UK and Danish colleagues on the, on the call, actually, how much there is on offer in the UK for businesses to connect with each other and with um, and with their um, customers. The UK has developed um, eight eight clusters around the country. They all have different specialisms: floating in Scotland and the southwest, um, composite manufacturing on the south coast where we're located, and O and M on the east coast as well. And I can share the slide. Happy to circulate the slide afterwards, but it really speaks to actually for businesses how important it is to connect with those clusters. Understand, understand how they can help them really establish, establish themselves in, in the UK. Next, and I'll go to the next slide. I guess finally, Sarah touched on, and the ambassador did as well, what an exciting time it is in the UK right now. It's exciting for COP26, exciting for the market, but also with that comes increased pressure to really deliver that economic benefit from offshore wind in the UK. But with that also comes support from the government government to do so. So we're certainly looking very closely at all this and I encourage all the businesses on the in the meeting to do so do so as well. I think to compete to supply chain, even though you're located in the UK, there's no no free ride in the UK. It's you've got to be globally competitive on price, quality and safety. But there's lots of lots of things around to help you do that. The clusters, the growth partnership and I'm sure DIT and the government are there to help help you do that as well. So I think it's exciting times, but we're really looking towards the government to help us push forward and really deliver those jobs and economic benefit as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary. That's great. Um, so we move on next to our final presenter, which is Andy from ABT. Hi, yeah, thanks, Gareth. Uh, Andy Ray from ABP. Um, I'm ABP's um, 
newly recruited, uh, eight weeks into the role now, um, group head of commercial for offshore wind. Um, so, so I'm kind of the essential function looking at how ABP can can make offshore wind a kind of part of their, their core business going forward. Um, so I've just got a few slides here just to kind of introduce ABP, uh, what we've done uh, historically in support of offshore wind, uh, the UK's offshore wind industry, uh, and and to, to tease it with a few images of what, what the potential uh, could be or what the future could look like uh, for ABP in the UK uh, going forward. Um, so ABP, uh, for those who don't know, uh, is the UK's leading port operator. We have 21 ports across England, Scotland and Wales. Um, and the map there showing the kind of the, the general geographic spread of, of our port infrastructure. Um, ABP's assets support around 120,000 jobs uh, in the UK. Uh, and, and those businesses which we help to support contribute, contribute seven and a half billion to the UK economy every year. Um, ABP itself is, is owned by a consortium of international investors, um, sovereign wealth funds and, uh, and large pension organizations. And th these, are, these are global um, investors who not only own uh, transport and infrastructure assets in the UK, but also right across the, the globe. Um, they're, they're involved in other ports and uh, airports and uh, other um, long-term infrastructure investments. Um, coming back to ABP's role uh, in supporting the offshore wind industry in the UK, um, ABP has been, for over a decade now, uh, our assets have supported um, not only the construction, but the, the uh, operations and maintenance of, of over 50% of the UK's offshore um, wind capacity, um, primarily uh, in terms of O&M through our facilities at, uh, in Grimsby, where Ersted have their uh, their kind of uh, their O and M centre for the UK, um, down to Lowestoft, um, supporting uh, some of the offshore wind farms off the East Anglian coast, uh, and then across in the Irish Sea in Barrow, uh, some of the some of the first offshore wind farms um, being developed out there um, are, are supported from O and M facilities within our um, the port of, of Barrow. Uh, so we so we've we've got history in this area. In terms of supporting construction and O and M phase, um, and and then about uh, back in 2016, uh, we developed heavy lift facilities on the Humber. Uh, these are this is this is an area of um, of land uh, on the Humber um, where we invested in excess of 150 million uh, alongside our our um, partner in that development, Siemens Gamesa, who who um, or Siemens now. As they as they build a blade manufacturing facility, uh, the the berths there are are capable of providing heavy lift um, capability for the export, the pre-assembly, import and export of of large wind turbine components. Uh, as I mentioned, Siemens have also got a blade manufacturing facility there, and there's also uh, as as Mary showed in the previous photograph, there's already a, or also an extensive area available for the pre-assembly. Of large wind turbine components. Um, in addition to that, on the Humber, we also uh, have attracted the uh, the ORE catapult. Uh, o and M uh, Centre of Excellence uh, is is being hosted in the port of Grimsby, uh, and so we're working in close collaboration with with the the, the catapult to establish and, and work with them and work with some of the the existing o and operators out of the port of Grimsby on, on what the future of O&M looks like for, for the UK's offshore wind industry. Um, so we're looking to collaborate on various innovations, whether it be innovative new fuels or the, the logistics of uh, how to manage and operate vessel movements in support of uh, O&M activities. In addition to that, ABP, we have a sister organization known as ABP Mayor, um, and I believe one of my colleagues is, is listening in today. Um, ABP Mayor are a long established um, marine and environment, uh, environmental consultancy providing services to offshore wind clients, um, particularly when it comes to the, the, the development phase, but, but also in terms of uh, ongoing operational support. And, and their focus is on where the marine environment meets the, uh, the, the marine users 
Uh, so that whether that be vessel movements, um, the the kind of the interaction between offshore and onshore um, when it comes to landing cables or, or cable burial assessments and things like that. Um, so as I mentioned before, ABP have a history in, in supporting the UK's offshore industry. Um, we've, we've invested significantly over the previous decade um, with, as I mentioned, over 150 million being invested in one asset on the Humber alone uh, since 2016. And an offshore wind has been identified by ABP as a kind of part of our, the core of our business going forward. Uh, so we, we certainly have an ambition to make significant investments going forward, whether that be to support O&M activities or um, the, the manufacturing or load out of uh, offshore wind components. You go to the next slide, please. I just wanted to run through a few images um, to kind of illustrate uh, what, what ABP have, have done um, over the past decade. So, so on the on the left hand side of, of this image, uh, we've got a, a spectacular image of, of Siemens facility um, being hosted at, at the um, the port of Hull. Um, sorry, my dog barking in the background there. Um, so this is this this is the Siemens um, blade manufacturing facility. Uh, and what you can see there is a, is a host of other components ready for load out uh, onto two installation vessels um, in, in support of the construction activity for the offshore wind farms just off the coast. Um, an example of some of the wind farms which have been uh, constructed using using this facility as a load out port, Dudgeon, Race Bank, Hornsea 1, uh, and going into next uh, next year, we'll, be, we'll see Hornsea 2. Um, be uh, be loaded out of that facility, um, but but we're not standing still. That that facility is, is fantastic and it, and it has supported the industry today. But as as Sarah uh, and other other speakers have mentioned, there's a huge ambition going forward. Um, 40 gigawatts by 2030, and then potentially hundreds of gigawatts uh, being installed right across um, the the North Sea uh, and and around Europe. And in order to, to support that, ABP recognised that we need more facilities, um, whether that be um, right up and down uh, the, the UK uh, coastline uh, and in Europe. Uh, there's just simply not enough capacity to, to, to meet the ambitions, not just of the UK, but also of the rest of Europe. Uh, there are significant kind of announcements of, of, um, of, of other European players um, looking to, to um, Develop out uh, offshore wind capacity. So, so it, with with that in mind, ABP have been looking at a host of options of how we can expand our existing footprint, uh, develop more areas to to support uh, the manufacturing supply chain, support increased load out capacity, so we can then build out at a faster rate offshore. And and the image on the right hand side there is just one of the scenarios that we that we're kind of. Um, working through at the moment, and, and that shows the, the expansion of the existing Green Port Hull facility into the re remainder of the, the, the dock area, and, and that effectively would double the capacity um, of, of the Green Port Hull uh, facility, um, able to support up to three gigawatts of, uh, of, of load out um, going forward. If we can skip to the next slide. Uh, but we're not just focused on the Humber. Uh, we have, uh, as I mentioned before, we've got 21 ports around the UK. Um, some of them already involved in offshore wind, but but others have the potential to be involved in offshore wind. So the image on the on the left hand side there is is a kind of an early uh, example of the potential for a facility such as Port Talbot. Um, so Port Talbot is a port which. Um, has long been associated with the steel industry. So there's a lot of heavy manufacturing already in place uh, and the skills and the workforce are available. Um, and with the, the potential for, for floating offshore wind and the development of the, of the Celtic and, and Southern uh, Irish Sea zones, um, we, we see that there's a significant opportunity for a port like Port Talbot um, to be used uh, to support the, the the development of floating offshore wind uh, going out um, over the over the next decade. Um, in particular, for this port, it has the advantage of having particularly deep water uh, and a lot of development land available. 
Uh, and as I mentioned, there's a, an existing um, heavy industrial uh, supply chain already present, which can be which can be turned um, and can be used to to um, to support the the float and offshore wind industry. On on the right hand side, there we we're, we're also looking at uh, that's the port of Lowestoft, um, which which currently supports a significant amount of um, existing operational offshore wind farms. So there are a few own M facilities uh, within the port, but we recognise that going forward, if if we want to build uh, a further 10 gigawatts of, of offshore wind just off the coast there in East Anglia, we, we need to develop our port infrastructure to help to meet that demand. Um, so what we have here is we're, we're, we're looking at plans to, to deepen the port to, to allow better access for some of the larger SOV type vessels, uh, which are going to be needed to support those offshore wind farms. And which are which are further offshore and just aren't feasible to be to be um, to be uh, supported on a kind of day-to-day -day basis using smaller CTV type vessels. Um, if we skip to the next slide, uh, so so some of the thoughts we've got uh, and perhaps uh, reflecting back on some of the learning we've had um, from from some of the developments we've uh, ABP have have deployed over the past kind of five to ten years. Um, Capturing local content, which I think is the ambition of, of UK PLC uh, and, and the whole offshore wind industry, relies uh, on the ready, ready availability of port facilities uh, and the manufacturing capacity that those port facilities can, can support. If, if we're going to get to 60% local content, we need, a significant, we need to significantly raise our game in terms of the, the manufacturing capacity and hence the port facilities available in the UK to be able to do that. Um, creating offshore wind hubs, which, which I think, again, um, as Sarah mentioned earlier on, that, that has been demonstrated right uh, in various other locations across Europe as being kind of the, the main success factor when it comes to stimulating um, local jobs, economic growth, and, and that clustering effect really accelerates um, the, the developments in terms of manufacturing capability for offshore wind. Um, and and if the UK can can develop a significant offshore wind hub, then that that is going to provide the UK the long term competitive advantage, not only to support the UK's industry, but as mentioned earlier on, we need to be able to support um, the rest of Europe and potentially globally in the US um, through exports. Um, but what I would say is investment decisions in in these kind of uh, infrastructure port facilities and manufacturing capability. They're, they're complex decisions to make. Um, they require alignment between national government, local government, the developers themselves, um, the port owners, and and the uh, supply chain organisations and manufacturers. We need to come together to come to to develop these these options uh, and to build the business case uh, to to enable the investment going forward. Um, the the path to those financial investment decisions is long, um, and what it needs um, in order to get it through financial investment decision um, is good visibility of the market. I, I believe we have that now. Um, we've got 40 gigawatt target by 2030 and, and significant ambitions to get to uh, a net zero by 2050. So I, I think we've, we've kind of closed off that market visibility aspect of it. Um, now it's a question of timing of the investment decisions, um, getting the CFD um, CFP rounds um, right, uh, and then getting the potential projects through the kind of consenting process uh, a lot faster than we've perhaps historically seen uh, is, is, is done. Um, but with that in mind, because of these long-term decision-making um, and the kind of development time required, I, I do foresee there need to be um, interim or hybrid solutions uh, being developed for the market. In, not necessarily for for um, fixed foundation uh, offshore wind farms, but I certainly think when it comes to floating offshore wind farm, there's there's the potential need um, to have interim solutions, which which perhaps um, enables us to use UK port infrastructure and some of the UK supply chain as a kind of interim step or hybrid step um, before we have um, the significant um, uh, visibility for the market uh, going forward. Um, and I look forward to the to the um, so hopefully some interesting uh, questions uh, in the next session. Thanks. 
Thank you very much, Andy, and also Mary and Sajana for those um, for those uh, slide presentations. Um, we have we've had some questions on um, on the Q and A, so I was going to going to just sort of pick up and, and group some of them and perhaps direct them at people too. Um, two of the presentations mentioned floating offshore wind, um, and we've had questions in on that topic. Um, specifically um, on the question of commercialization um, and also uh, the differences of, of going about developing floating and uh, traditional anchored offshore wind. But perhaps I'll go to Mary in the first instance. As you mentioned in your presentation about the footprint of the component parts of, of offshore. Perhaps if uh, you could respond on that on those questions. Sure. I think. I had I had another picture that I didn't actually put in the deck that shows how big floating foundations are and the scale the scale is scale is immense. But um, I think for us as a turbine manufacturer, for floating we're we're quite agnostic we're quite agnostic about what we put the what we put the turbine on. And actually, we see one of the main barriers to commercialisation is actually industry settling on a foundation foundation concept. As you would all have seen, we've installed many. A number of pre-commercial projects on different different foundations. We're agnostic, we're agnostic about that, but actually we see the challenge for once this time perhaps isn't ours. We'll keep innovating in our technology, but actually the challenge for the commercialisation of floating is around the foundations and finding a finding a concept that the industry can get behind and then drive drive the cost down cost down on that. And, and perhaps um, the the other element. To, I guess the commercialisation will be the, the policy interventions, and, and obviously we've got allocation round four, which was touched on in the prior presentation, and the separate category for um, floating offshore wind. Um, Sanjana, will will Equinor be taking interest in in that part of the CFD when it comes out? Will you be scrutinising to see the opportunity there and and what works at a commercial level? For this subsector, Gareth, and I suppose uh, you know we we really welcome that uh, that change in allocation run for is really positive to see that uh, UK is putting bottom flicks in its own pot, and you know it shows the strategic importance that uh, the UK is placing on offshore wind and the commitment as well. So that's something that we we see as a huge positive because that also provides a, a new route to market for for floating projects now that it has its own pot really. Um, no, no early views around allocation uh, round four. Uh, we think we we maxed out on round three with uh, with Dogger Bank, I suppose. But uh, you know, Dogger Bank came out as uh, very competitive, so we expect our round four to remain competitive as it goes along. Allocation. Thank you. Um, the theme of this particular session is around the supply chain opportunities, and we heard earlier that there is a very much a, an objective, a goal to try and reach 60, a 60 percent target of local content by 2030. Uh, and I'm interested, you know, based on where we are now and where we need to go, do, do, do any of the panel members have any observations on? Whether that's a realistic target, um, and and if it is or if it isn't, you know, what 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 are the key steps that need to happen over the next few years in order to really have a good go at getting there? Um, Andy, I guess ABP are at the coal face of many of these projects. Do you have any observations on this topic? Um, uh, yes, um, the. If, if we want to achieve that, that run rate going forward of, of whatever three and a half, four gigawatts per annum being installed, we, we, I mean, in order to get 60% local content of those, we, we need to almost treble the UK's ability to provide uh, content for, for these uh, offshore wind farms, whether that be the, the blades which go into the turbines, the foundations, or, or the cable manufacturing. Um, so so it, it's a significant curve to, to kind of go up. Um, but I think, uh, as Sarah mentioned earlier on, the, the, the UK government has the ambition to get there. 
Um, it's taken the right steps in terms of uh, developing this, this base offshore wind um, manufacturing fund, which is which is there to support the port infrastructures to get them ready to enable the manufacturers to to invest in in, in the capacity. Um, I, I think it, I think everyone would recognise that there needs to be UK um, capacity there, but also European capacity needs to increase as well. So it's it's not just a case of um, we're, we're we're displacing European capacity. It, it's the whole industry needs to put, uh, treble its capacity, and that's just for Europe. That doesn't include looking at Asia or the US. So there's a huge uh, mountain to, mountain to climb, but at least we've taken the first step in, in that we've got government support to make it happen. And, and picking yeah, up the I, sorry, go ahead. No, not at all. I think I think Andy's right. I think it would be. I think more in terms of jobs than I do percentages. It's back to my point about people and people being employed in the UK, delivering delivering these things. I think that's also a really important measure measure of success as well. Um, I think it's going to be tough. I think everything that we do will drive a competitive response from our colleagues in other markets, not only Europe now, but also in Asia, the US, and the Far East as well. So I think. We're, we're in a global game now, which is perhaps not where we were five, seven, five, seven years ago, where we've had, had a bit more, uh, more of a run of the pitch. And Mary, just to pick up another question that, that's risen on the chat function, the, obviously the, the opportunities that exist for, for UK PLC are obviously the new deployment that, that is getting a lot of attention. There's obviously the O&M as well. But it won't be too far down the line where things like decommissioning or repowering opportunities will come as well. And is, is that, I mean, maybe that's included in one of the buckets of, of new deployment, but I don't know whether that's an area that MHI Vestas are looking at or considering as a market opportunity, because that will need capacity as well. Completely, I think about decommissioning, we particularly think about our um, blade recycling I think when you see there's a very specific challenge about what we what we do with those blades, how we how we recycle them because of the composite material that they're made in made with. And I think and there's a lot going on at European level to think through how we do this and what's the what's the viable way to do this at a um, economically competitive way. But I think I hope I hope we'll still be allowed to be involved in some of those projects. But also the the high value manufacturing catapults being involved put together a suswind initiative which we're really excited about which will look at UK ways for UK methods, UK industry for recycling blades. So um I think there's definitely an opportunity there. But um yeah, blade recycling is top of our top of our mind when we think about decommissioning of projects. Thank you. Thank you. It's just, and, um, just, um, if I can just come in on that. It's worth worth noting that the, the, the plans currently around port infrastructure and manufacturing, that, that's just to supply the additional 30 gigawatts we need going forward. We're going to be bringing some of the original wind farms off the bars in that period as well. So we need to then replace that. So it's not just 30 gigawatts, it's potentially 35 gigawatts, maybe even 40 we need to build out. So it's, um, and, and the current plans, I don't think go significantly far in looking at what we need in terms of capacity to be able to facilitate all of that decommissioning activity as well. So. This is just the first step of a of a road. Thanks, Andy. I was going to put a. I'm conscious of time and, and the, the the sessions that follow. So, I was going to put a, a final question to you, in fact, which is the topic of hydrogen. Um, this did come up on on um, the presentation. There's, there's an awful lot of um, discussion about hydrogen at the moment, and um, in particular, combining offshore wind in order to produce hydrogen, green hydrogen, at times of lower demand. So, um, a, a huge amount of work I know is being done with Frontier Economics and government at the moment about what that market design would look like. But do, do the panels, does the panel members have any observations about that opportunity and how that might develop as well as you know alongside the core opportunity of just building out the offshore wind itself to supply power. I, I think. 
go ahead. Sorry. I suppose I can kick off uh, as uh, something I uh, mentioned earlier as well. I think us in Aikuna, we feel like, you know, there is a future where offshore wind is to be linked with um, energy storage and uh, hydrogen specifically. Hydrogen really is something that uh, can add to the competitiveness of the renewables in the, in the years to come um, because it, it adds uh, value and it also provides an alternative route to market for uh, for renewables. That's uh, consistently put as one of the one of the various ways to reduce that intermittency to make sure that it also provides a decarbonization route for a harder to abate sector as well. If I, if I take the example of um, North H2, which is a project that we're working with um, Shell, RWE, and gasoline, the idea is to have about four gigawatts of offshore wind servicing uh, to provide almost 0.4 million tons of green hydrogen. And then by 2040, getting up to 1 million tons of green hydrogen, that can actually abate between 8 to 10 million CO2 emissions, which is, uh, you know, equivalent to the yearly emissions of road traffic in uh, in Norway, uh, our, our origin. So, with offshore wind sort of expanding so much, um, it is really suited to getting that uh, green hydrogen value chain being developed. So, really, um, there is some belief in here across the industry. I'm, I'm sorry uh, to cut in on the discussion, but uh, I'm afraid we, we do need to, uh, to to wrap this session up. Uh, Gareth, do you have a, a final uh, final remark? Just to say um, thank you, everyone, to the panelists and your contributions, and thank you for the questions. And clearly, a great amount of work has been done. There's already lots of opportunities for the supply chain, and there are many more opportunities coming with new development, O&M, repowering, and new markets. Um, so, you know, it would be great to see as much local content coming in at all of those levels of the value chain. Thank you, Rasmus. Thank you very much, Gareth, and uh, thank you, Sanjana, Andy, and Mary as well for joining the panel. Really appreciate it, and thank you for your inputs. We, uh, we, we're running a bit late, so uh, we, will, uh, we will hurry on. Uh, our next speaker is Gabriel Davis from Austed. She is the head of asset management at Hornsey 2, and she will talk about a topic which has um, influenced uh, a lot of uh, 2020. So she will talk about Austed's experience of constructing during, during COVID times and how uh, to keep the project on uh, on time. Before I hand over to uh, Gabriel, uh, she's asked me to do uh, one thing which makes a webinar organizer's blood run cold, and that is uh, to uh, show a short video. So uh, just bear with us for a second while we uh, we try to uh, sort out any uh, technical issues. But uh, but all joking aside, I think it's really worth it to to see it because it shows in a in a uh, in a good way. Uh, not just what they're doing at Hornsey 2, but also uh, it's an image on the whole industry as such, what we are delivering. Yeah, over to you. Climate change is the defining challenge of our time. If we want to keep global warming within 1.5 degrees of pre-industrial levels, we need to take action now. The good news is that we have the solutions. At Allstead, our ambition is to help create a world that runs entirely on green energy. Hornsey 1, Hornsey 2 projects, they're more than just big projects. They are us upscaling how we fight climate change. So in the past, companies have always been taking from the planet, and now it's really important that we're able to give back. I'm very proud and uh, honored uh, to be part of this project. This is the kind of thing that you see on television, that's on the Discovery Channel. I never thought in my life that I would be part of something so important. Hornsey 1 is currently the world's largest offshore wind farm. When Hornsey 2 is ready, it will generate 1.4 gigawatts of clean energy, about the same as a nuclear power station, but at a fraction of the price. Hornsey 2 breaks the barrier and turns the offshore wind business from eco-ideal into eco-economic sense. 
Hornsey 1 and 2 together will supply 2.6 million homes with clean and green energy. We need to move away from digging sunshine out of the ground, burning sunshine. We need to move towards the things that all step do. We need to power it for our consuming. Well, I think we all have a duty to leave this planet as least and as good as we found it and probably, hopefully, better than we found it for our future generations. The Hornsey 2 project is a hugely exciting, rewarding project. We are pushing the boundaries not only in our schedule, in our design, in all aspects of the project. Coming from a younger generation, um, obviously it's quite apparent that we, we're, we're looking for things to change. And obviously me being uh, of an age of only 22, I, I'm happy to say that I've been involved in a change like this. It's the pride in the job. And it's knowing that the jobs I've done over 40 years, I can still go past and see and still have that. I did that. Why not join us and make this happen together? Okay, thanks Rasmus. I'm now going to share uh, my presentation. Thank you. So thank you so much to the Danish Embassy um, and the Danish UK Association for inviting me to speak at today's webinar. So if you've heard, I'm Gabriel Davis. I'm responsible for all commercial consenting regulatory and divestment work streams for Orsted's Hornsey 2 offshore wind farm. The video you just, you just watched will have given you an introduction to the Hornsey 2 wind farm, and I would like to clarify that it was all filmed pre-COVID. Before I begin discussing the challenges and mitigations that we've managed during this year, I would just like to first give you a brief introduction to Orsted and our offshore wind business. So, um, Orsted is a Danish company, of course, which in 2017 transitioned to focus only on renewable energy. We are the global market leader in offshore wind with 6.8 gigawatts of operational capacity and a further 3.1 gigawatts being constructed by 2022. Our ambition is to have 15 gigawatts installed offshore wind capacity by 2025. In addition to our offshore wind business, we have a fast growing onshore wind unit with the current 1.6 gigawatts of operational capacity and our pipeline should take us to 5 gigawatts by 2025. And finally, our markets and bioenergy division. We have converted all of our heat and power plants from coal and gas to biomass and waste energy. And in Denmark, we hold 25% of the heat and power generation market. When it comes to offshore wind, Orsted has an unrivaled track record. We began 30 years ago with the five megawatt Binderby wind farm. We've grown significantly since then. Our largest operational wind farm, Hornsey One, has a 1.2 gigawatt operational capacity powered by 174 seven megawatt turbines. And as you've seen, Hornsey Two will be even larger. The UK is Orsted's largest offshore wind market with 12 operational wind farms and the current 5.8 gigawatts installed capacity. This provides power for 4.5 million homes. And we're currently building Hornsey 2, which will be the world's largest offshore wind farm when it becomes operational. It's 1.4, it will be 1.4 gigawatts and 90 kilometers off the North Lincolnshire coast. Construction began onshore in 2018 with our onshore substation and has been progressing at pace since then. And we're now well into offshore construction with 24 foundations already installed in the seabed. Construction is due to complete in early 2022, with the wind farm becoming fully operational shortly thereafter. So Hornsey 2 as a project has a clear and simple mission to deliver, to, to deliver our promise to safely build the world's biggest and best value offshore wind farm. But our legacy is just as important as our mission, enrichment. So we do not want Hornsey 2 to be just another project to those who are working on it, whether they are Orsted employees or from one of our contract partners. So from day one, we have focused on creating an environment where everyone can thrive. Now, this may not seem like um, a priority during a pandemic, but for us, maintaining this thriving environment has been essential to how the Hornsey 2 project has navigated the challenges brought by COVID. We've had to make many adjustments, but our continued focus on innovation, individual and team development and safety has proved to be very effective 
in maintaining not only the high standards required to continue constructing, but has meant that morale and motivation have remained strong. And we do this through our safety model, Plan, Care, Communicate. Plan, Care, Communicate is how we work. We plan early, we care about our people, and we communicate constantly. And it's not just about safety. It also forms the cultural and behavioral backbone of the Hornsey 2 project. And I believe it is the reason we've been so successful in continuing construction during COVID. Throughout the pandemic, we have maintained a focus on conventional safety as well. COVID could easily have created a distraction from the very high safety standards that are essential to safely building an offshore wind farm. And the industry as a whole has unfortunately seen standards slipping during COVID, but we are proud that this has not happened on Hornsey 2 um, because safety on our sites will always be one of the biggest risks that we manage. We began planning how to mitigate the impact of COVID um, back in January. We are constructing our offshore substation in Singapore and Indonesia so we could see what was coming. And we began planning our mitigations before the pandemic hit European shores. The Hornsey 2 project has also been working closely with Orsted's UK and global COVID response task forces, ensuring an aligned response across our business units. We have consistently been putting people's physical and mental health and well-being front and centre by implementing all reasonable uh, safety measures that we can. And we've also provided our people with everything they need physically, emotionally and procedurally to ensure that they and their teams are fully supported in safely delivering their works. We have to make sure that people understand what's being done to make them safe, what their part in it is and, and why it's so important. So we've also been listening to the concerns received from our people and ensure that we have clear communications around how we're addressing those concerns. So the first real COVID challenge that we encountered came with the spring lockdown in the UK. We immediately had to work out how we could continue safely constructing while the UK was shutting down around us. And we did face a number of challenges. So first and foremost, of course, we had to focus on physical and psychological safety concerns of our people. At the same time, we were complying with quickly changing government guidance. We had to procure additional PPE, figure out how we could make social distancing practicalities work on our sites, and align with our contractors um, to make sure that we had the same consistent approach across all of our sites. We also had to rapidly develop new people-focused and employment law compliant HR policies and guidance. For example, temperature measurements, shielding, and adjustments to shift patterns to enable testing for COVID pre-mobilization. So we did this um, through the principle of ALARP. Now, for those uh, not familiar with the ALARP principle, it means simply as low as reasonably practicable. So we did not pretend that we could or were even aiming for 100% COVID-free sites. That was, and, and it remains, not possible. Um, but what we did promise is that we would ensure that the risk of catching COVID on any of our sites was ALARP. The approach we took were, um, was one that's referred to in the industry as Swiss cheese. So there are always some holes, but if you build up enough layers, it's more difficult for the risk in question to find its way through. So each layer alone is not enough to significantly reduce the risk of our employees and contractors catching COVID, but we focused on the ways in which combined we could keep the risk low. And these measures are really very simple. We have limited access to our sites to business critical employees only. Everyone entering site must have their temperature taken. We offer antigen and PCR testing, and we have adjusted um, offices and site operations to enable physical distancing. And of course, we have the additional PPE uh, where that's required. Our ALARP measures have been very successful and Public Health England have been supportive of our approach to keeping our sites safe during the pandemic. And here are just a few images of some of these measures implemented on our sites. So at our Humberside Construction Office, um, we've set up a COVID testing area. We also have touchless thermometers and auto hand gel dispensers and have prescribed access routes in and out of offices for all staff. When it comes to our site construction measures, we've um, amended all work procedures so that they're COVID-19 compliant and have built those rules into the start of every work briefing. We also make sure that work groups are bubbled together so they're not interacting with other workers. I mean, just to give you an idea of the scale for our onshore cable route at the peak of construction this year, there are 130 operatives on site. 
Um, and, and really the principle we have is that if a task cannot be done safely with social distancing, then we do provide the additional PPE. So as if the challenges of COVID-19 in the UK were not difficult enough, we've also had to manage the impact on our global supply chain. I mean, one thing that actually has enabled us to work quickly and effectively mitigate our COVID challenges is the fact, as I've mentioned, that we're constructing our offshore substation in Singapore. Now, Singapore have actually been very successful at managing the outbreak, and we've learned a lot from them. However, they did experience outbreaks in the dormitories that housed uh, many of the workers, and this did present a challenge to our project. There was a circuit breaker imposed in April in Singapore, which meant a two-month shutdown of the yards where the Hornsey 2 offshore substation top sites um, are being constructed. But despite the challenge this presented, um, our strong project culture, which is shared with our principal contractors over in Singapore, um, this has meant we've been able to mitigate any delays and we remain on track to be fully operational in early 2022 as planned. So on to the next challenge. So Hornsey 2 is, of course, a UK wind farm, but Orsted is a Danish company. A significant proportion of our team are based in Denmark and the travel quarantines, which came into force in June, did pose challenges to our progress because we need to keep our people moving. However, working closely with our regulatory team, who've got a really strong relationship with Bayes and they have weekly calls with them, we've been able to feed back to government about how quarantine regulations would impact you know, our nationally significant infrastructure project. And as a result, we've been able to find a way through to enable business with critical members of the team and key contract partners to continue to travel. So finally, uh, our people and supporting their mental health and well-being. So we believe that our success is only possible because of our people. We have world leading technology and some of the best talent in the industry, but we can't deploy it successfully if our people are not equipped physically and mentally to carry out their roles. Orsted has always put people front and center of everything we do. And this people over profits culture has always meant high safety standards and excellent working conditions for everyone regardless of whether they are office or site-based. So of course, COVID created a unique challenge that you'll all be very familiar with, um, but for our safety approach at Allstead, you know, we really did need to, to not only quickly plan how we could keep our site-based employees and contractors safely working, but almost overnight, we needed to ensure a huge proportion of the workforce could work effectively from home. And for many of us, the spring lockdown has brought additional challenges of homeschooling our children or caring for friends and family who have been forced to shield. And again, plan is key. So from the senior leadership and throughout the wider team, we focused on communicating our plans clearly and we're deep at the forefront. We focus a lot on mental health, creating a culture where everyone has been encouraged to talk about how they're coping and to ask for help if they need it. So the message was and still is very simple. It's okay to not be okay. So now that the UK and much of Europe have been through two lockdowns and their ongoing restrictions, the biggest challenge we face is COVID fatigue. It's been a really long year and it's hard to maintain focus on all the measures in place to reduce the risk of COVID spreading on our sites. So while our plans are under constant review and we revise them as guidance changing, um, we are focusing now more than ever on caring and communicating. So while the end may be in sight, you know, there are still several months of COVID restrictions ahead of us. So we need to remain focused on avoiding that COVID fatigue and continuing the success that we've had to date in mitigating the challenges that we face. So just to wrap up, um, it's, a, it's a real testament to the Hornsey 2 team's people-focused and one-team approach that we've not only been able to maintain progress building what will be the world's largest offshore wind farm when it becomes operational, but that we finish 2020 with stronger relationships and even more trust um, within the team and with our contract partners perhaps than we started with. And now with the vaccine rollout already underway in the UK, we're looking forward to a new year with a feeling of hope and excitement because it's gonna be the most intense year of construction for Hornsey 2. And speaking on behalf of the entire Hornsey 2 team, we cannot wait. So just to um, finish up by summarizing our three key learnings from constructing the world's largest offshore wind farm during a pandemic. So maintaining our focus on enriching and not just surviving has meant the Hornsey 2 project team and our contract partners have remained focused, energized and able to deliver. Our safety model, Plan Care Communicate, not only enables successful execution, 
but the simplicity of the model provides clarity and focus while a global crisis unfolded around our project and the lives of everyone involved. And finally, that very simple message that it's okay to not be okay. Mental health and well-being are not secondary, regardless of deadlines or specific project challenges. And if psychological health is prioritized, then the team will be able to perform. Thank you for listening. Gabriel, thank you so much for this. And it's really interesting to see how a huge engineering project like this is kept on track, uh, even though we are in very, very challenging uh, circumstances. Uh, speaking as one who has been uh, uh, at the forefront of uh, assisting Danish companies in um, in their challenges with the with the travel uh, ban, I can uh, assure you that uh, there's, there's there's been so many difficulties in this. So that it, that we're able to continue is uh, is really impressive uh, and uh, an excellent news for, for all of us. We uh, we have to hurry on uh, to the next speaker. And uh, until now, uh, all the presentations have been looking at the UK market. But uh, as we heard in the panel discussion, uh, the supply chain is growing in uh, the UK, and we are uh, there are being developed innovative solutions. Uh, just to mention a few of them are a commitment to power to X, and also um, uh, some of the work that's been done within floating surely will create a supply chain with the capabilities that uh, can be exported. So that's why I'm really uh, excited that uh, Michael Hannibal from uh, Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners is uh, is here to give us sort of a, a helicopter view and and uh, and uh, his outlook on what the sort of global opportunities are in the offshore wind sector. Uh, obviously, uh, Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners is is uh, very well positioned with the uh, offshore activities on uh, almost all continents. Uh, so, Michael, thank you very much for for joining us. Over to you. Yeah, thanks, Rasmus. Uh, and please uh, note that you can hear me well. Okay. Um, yeah, um, I, I'm also a little bit short of time, and I guess many of you are short on time, so I, I will do it in, in a quick way. Um, and, and thanks for putting a few words on, on CIP, uh, a fund management uh, company uh, founded in, in 2012, actually uh, the world's largest fund manager uh, dedicated to greenfield renewable infrastructure investments, uh, doing offshore uh, and, and both uh, floating and, and fixed onshore, solar, uh, photovoltaic, uh, biomass, waste to energy, hydro, storage, uh, and a lot of more things. Um, to, to put things a little bit into perspective, uh, Rasmus asked me to, to uh, look a little bit more globally, and I think we, we can all agree that during the last decade, uh, a, a, a tremendous growth ha has been experienced, and it has been a journey for, for all of us taking part of it. 2019 uh, was a record year for offshore wind, uh, more than six gigawatt uh, added and, and cumulative. Uh, I think we passed uh, 29 gigawatt. 2020 uh, will, uh, despite the, the COVID uh, and with initiatives like green recovery, uh, be uh, expected to be another uh, good growth year. Uh, the, the interesting thing, uh, putting the, um, the European numbers into a larger perspective, is that looking ahead towards 2030, um, expectations are that, that we will pass 230 gigawatt uh, some numbers are 234 uh, in, in 2030. And that's, of course, super, super interesting. Uh, and, and with uh, more than uh, approximately 10 gigawatt of loading also uh, put in place. This, of course, uh, means that uh, a lot, lot of technology innovation will have to happen. Uh, there will be a lot of focus on uh, electrification. There will be a lot of focus on uh, decarbonization of the transport sector uh, and so on. But it also means that a lot of growth will happen uh, outside, um, for this case, UK and, and, and Denmark and, and, and North Sea. Um, and, and with our experience being on all uh, continents, uh, US, Europe, uh, Asia, Taiwan, Japan, Korea, Vietnam, Philippines, Australia, and so on, there seems to be a pattern uh, which goes around uh, localization and, and how to do this in, in new markets. 
so, so I think the the, uh, the observation is that there is a good uh, opportunity now for finding out how one can team up in a global way so that we can be global uh, still, uh, making sure that the global uh, knowledge is used, but it will have to be used in local uh, societies. So basically teaming uh, global up with local and thereby manage uh, that we as a sector will continue to deliver on our promises when it comes to time, cost, quality, health and safety, performance, and not lose the trust of uh, basically uh, making sure that, that things also in the future will be uh, bankable. Uh, so so I think that's the, the short uh, version of, of what I had uh, planned to get around. And then back to you, Rasmus. Michael, thank you so much for uh, for for that input, and uh, I think it's uh, it's definitely something both for uh, as a takeaway for the Danish supply chain and for uh, for, uh, for for the UK supply chain that there are uh, emerging markets uh, where this uh, sort of uh, global competences can be used locally. So uh, so uh, so really interesting. I I'm afraid that we've run over uh, quite a lot, and uh, I will uh, I will need to wrap up today's uh, today's session. But uh, first of all, let me just say thank you to all of you that have uh, listened in on today's conversation. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, as I said in the beginning, it's the eighth uh, time that we organise this uh, this webinar, this uh, conference. So um, so we hope to uh, to be able to come back. Uh, with uh, another conference next year, uh, the date is the second of December, and uh, and we really hope that you'll be able to join us there as well. So uh, so for now, I'd just like to say thank you from me here at the embassy. Thank you from uh, from the Danish UK Association. Uh, thank you to our sponsors, uh, AVP and Gowling Ostel, and also for for everyone who has supported us in uh, terms of making this. Um, this uh, event possible. We will uh, shortly be sharing uh, the, uh, a link to the recording of the, um, of the event and, uh, and just uh, uh, end by saying uh, thank you very much for joining and, and see you again uh, soon, hopefully. Bye for now.